Hi, this is Eva, and you can find me as the charm of it, all one word, and Instagram, Ravelry, and uh, my blog, which is thecharmofit.wordpress.com. All that information will be in the little box beneath the video. Anyway, and I'm here for another episode of my knitting podcast. So this time we will be talking about my finished objects and works in progress. And I, instead of answering a question first and then talking about a tip later, I'm going to flip it around because the questions I've had this week are, they require a bit more of an answer. So really quickly, just as a fun tip, if you were like me, I don't have a printer. So I don't usually print my patterns. Instead, I download them as PDFs and then I use them on my phone. And I used to just open them up on my phone and just kind of scroll. Where is Thistle? This is Thistle. She's had a haircut. Anyway, I used to just open up patterns and kind of scroll so that when I'm reading a chart, the row that I needed was easier to read. But then I discovered a free app called JNet Lite, and I will link to this. I have an iPhone, so I don't know if it's for Android. I would assume so. Um, Light is spelled L-I-T-E, and otherwise it's just JNet. And it allows you to open PDFs in it. So if you have the chart saved as a JPEG, it won't work, but PDFs are fine, which is what most Ravelry patterns are. And once you've opened it up, hang on, let me find a free pattern so that I can show you. That one doesn't have a chart. I don't have any free charted patterns on here. Okay, but so I'll show you on this, even though it doesn't have a chart. Maybe you're not going to be able to see that. Do you see the little yellow line? That's the highlight bar. And you can have it displayed or hidden. And you can adjust its width. And then you can move it around. So it's really invaluable for chart reading. Um, and then it's also really useful just for general pattern stuff. Because I can just, like I have on there, even though it's not a chart, I have it marked what row I need to do next so that if I don't knit for a few days, I can pull out the pattern and that'll be fine. Oh, and here's Moth. Got the full menagerie <laughs> as usual. As you can see, I decided to stick to this recording spot because if I'm gonna spend an hour sitting, it seems only fair to spend that time in a pet accessible place. Anyway, um, I am wearing a hand knit sweater today that you can no longer see because of the pets. <laughs> but it is the Isis tailcoat pattern. And, and I did it in Quince and Company's Lark, which has their worsted weight, and Bird's Egg, which is a light green blue that's very muted. So this was my Christmas one of my Christmas presents from my mom last year was the yarn to knit this and the pattern. So that was very fun. I knit it, I think, in March, yes, for spring. Because this seems like a very spring color. And I, it only took me three weeks from start to finish. I was really surprised. I think because it's all stockinette, except for some ribbing on the cuffs and on the shawl collar, which does lay straight. It's just armchairs are not conducive to good posture. Um, and there's a really fun, the construction's really fun. First you do, there's a swingy tail part to it. That's why it's called a tail coat that I would show you if I were not, if I were able to get up right now. <laughs> anyway, and then you knit the body and the sleeves and then at the end you do the collar. And I added I-cord bind offs to everything. The sleeves are knit bottom up, but I did a provisional cast on so that it would match completely because I have strong feelings about matching like that, apparently, because it's nice and reversible for the shawl collar. I would definitely recommend the pattern. I really like the designer. I think her name is Carrie Ellen. She's based in the UK, and she works with an alpaca yarn company, but her patterns are very... She has a very unusual kind of design aesthetic that I don't see, like the kinds of things that she comes up with, I don't see a lot of similar stuff on Ravelry, and I find it very inspiring. She does a lot of kind of traditional inspired things. Apparently Moth likes the lapel too. Someone needs her dew claw trimmed. I'm 
not going to be able to bring it up, but the pattern is really clear and easy to follow, and I messaged the designer before I started because I was trying to figure out how to modify the waist shaping a little, and the waist part is not like a typical pullover, so I wasn't really sure what to do about that, and she answered really quickly and helpfully. So yeah, I would definitely recommend it. And I really want to knit some more of her designs one of these days. She has some dresses that are just beautiful. And if I had children, oh my gosh, she has the cutest kid knits. Anyway, and I really like Quince & Company's Lark. I'm wearing this with just a short sleeve blouse. Um, and it's not itchy at all. Super soft. It has worn surprisingly well. I knit it at a looser gauge than what's recommended because the pattern called for a little bit heavier yarn. Um, and it's still, it's just got a few pills on like the high sleeve areas, but I'm sure that I can depill those when I stop being lazy. Um, so yeah, I've worn it a lot. I really love it. I can see knitting the pattern again, maybe changing some things up. I would love to do one with a slightly different skirt and do it with stripes, like circus tent style stripes. So we'll see. Always lots of plans for knitting. But okay, so now I've done my tip and what I'm wearing, it is time to talk about my finished objects. Oh, I gotta have this arm. So first, this is only a semi-finished object. I knit this last winter. It was the start of my great neckwear experiment. Yes, I know. And, oh, sorry. And so I started with just a little scarflet. This is made out of Quince's Osprey, which is their I don't know, heavier than worsted, but not bulky yarn. I promise I'm not sponsored by Quince. That would be fabulous if they wanted to send me free yarn, but I just really like them because I love all their different yarn bases and their colors and that they're ethically made, so they've pretty much become my go-to. But anyway, okay, so this is just a little scarflet, and I thought I would start here because if this worked well for my neckwear, then obviously Doing a little thing like this takes less yarn and less time. And I used a free pattern, the Anthro-inspired scarflet, I think. And as you can tell, it's got giant leaves, which I'm a quirky dresser, so I like the leaves sitting out wide, but all my friends and family think it looks better when I do them floppy. Anyway, okay, so I knit this last winter, and I knit it so that it would fit snugly because I really don't like it when the wind can get into neckwear. I know it's not as flattering when it's right up next to your neck, but I don't really care when it's cold out. Whether I look good or not, I just want to not be freezing because if the wind does get in, then I look like this, and that's not flattering either. So then I blocked it, and that's when I discovered, because I had not swatched, that Osprey grows. And it, so this middle part that determines how snug it is grew by like an inch and a half, I think, just enough so that it sat further down like this. So I finally pulled it back to the length that the middle section should be to be snug. This color is fjord and it's not quite showing up as true. It's more muted in real life. It's showing up a bit bluer on the camera. Okay. I don't know why my camera likes to intensify blues. Anyway, <laughs> you've got both the pets flopped out in front of you. Um, so I pulled out, so I had to pull back the leaf and the ribbing, and then I ripped back to the distance for the neck, and then I re-knit the leaf and the ribbing. And since it was on size nine needles, it didn't take very long to redo. So now I have a more wearable piece for that for winter and then I finished one more neckwear piece and this one was not fast I finished my antiquarian scarf and it's more teal than it's showing up on screen we've just established my computer likes to make everything smurf colored anyway so here is the final result it is made out of Pearl Soho's line weight which is a heavy lace light fingering single ply merino and Anya reassured me that it would grow in the blocking, and oh my gosh, did it grow. I think I ended up blocking it, not super aggressively, but definitely aggressively. It was 42 inches when I bound off, 
and now it's 62 inches long. So that is a lot of growth. I'm still new to scarf and lace knitting, so I did not expect that. It did lose an inch in width uh, by comparison, but I'm very relieved because now I have a few different options for the length for the ends. I can wear it a single wrap or I can loop it twice around. Yeah, you're gonna help me demonstrate how I can wear my scarves. Okay. I'm gonna just flip out the ends of it. Or when it's not so cold out, I can just wear it just around my neck. And that's really fun when it goes under the lapels. I did that. So I'm very pleased with the final result. It's still soft and smushy, even though I blocked it. I was afraid that. If I blocked it too aggressively, I would lose all that fun poofiness of garter stitch. I will say that um, this yarn felts fairly easily. Well, not felt, but it starts to, like, I would not want to frog this scarf. have to frog this scarf in my knitting. You can tell which end I knit first. Well, maybe you can't on camera. But can you look in person? I'm sorry. Are we disturbing you? One of them just looks a little more solid than the other one. Luckily, I don't need to frog it, so we're good. Um, another episode I want to talk about the strangeness of how different projects take different lengths of time, even when it's the exact same amount of yarn. But I have too much to talk about today to get into that. So when I finished this, I had some yarn left over because apparently my yarn scale lies to me, uh, but I didn't want to have to try to keep going and figure out a way to make both the ends symmetrical, so I just called it good. And then this was souvenir yarn from my first trip to New York City, which I did for my birthday this past April. Now that I live in upstate New York, I can get there by a train. And so I popped into Pearl Soho. So it was my souvenir yarn. So I wanted something that I could put in the apartment. So I kind of poked around Ravelry and I found these really cute little butterflies. Hang on. Okay. That's probably the easiest way to show it to you. So it is a pattern by Sarah Elizabeth Kellner, who is my go-to designer for softies that I knit my niece, the bunnies that I showed. And I've knit some of her other patterns too, and they've all turned out really well. So this is, I held the line weight doubled because the pattern, she said she uses, used DK and sport weight. I'm sorry. I'm, there we go. Okay, so I did the line weight doubled, and then I used some leftover quince turn in Stonington for the wings. And then when I was weaving in ends, I just added the little dots. And the body, and I still need to add the antennae, are just out of some leftover ultra alpaca light, the sport one in black, that I had left over from a hat I knit for someone. And I really love it. Um, this one I knit to put on my wreath. I have a fiber wreath hanging above my computer. And so I haven't decided yet if I'm going to put her flat like I showed you or I like it in profile as well. So um, I'll try them both out and decide. But what I really love is the pattern design shows multiple butterflies in a shadow box. And I want to do that now. So I have quite a few different scraps. And this took barely any yarn. Even holding the line weight double, it took about 14 yards. I didn't measure the turn. So I don't know how much it took of that. But less than 14, obviously, since it's a smaller amount. But so I have lots of different leftover scrap yarns that I think would make lovely moths and butterflies. And I would really like to do a shadow box or two to put on my wall. So... The one thing about this pattern, and I highly recommend it because it's really easy to follow and all the shaping is included and she tells you when to switch if you want wingtips a different color. And she includes lots of helpful photos. But there are a bunch of ends to weave in because you knit the body and then you do each wing separately. And especially, so if you switch 
three different colored the wing tips. That means each wing is going to have a minimum of four ends. And since I held both of these yarns double, I had eight ends on each wing. So I had 32 ends plus two on the body to weave it. But it didn't really bother me because that almost feels like hand sewing. Um, so I was perfectly fine with it. And... I would knit more of these, but yeah, I definitely spent as much time weaving in the ends as I did on the knitting. So depending on what you enjoy about knitting, this might not be the pattern for you. But it's only $2.50, so I think it's money well spent, and I cannot wait for my shadow box. Ooh, little butterfly. Okay. I still have some more yarn left over, so I'm actually thinking about dusting off my crochet hooks and making a little Peter Pan collar. But we will see, um, because crocheting is a lot harder on my hands and wrists. My next finished object is my Winter Forest Tam. That's the pattern. It's a free one on Ravelry, and mine I just called Wintry Woods. So, if you recall last week, I was up to here and I was waiting for some brown Shetland wool to arrive, and it arrived, and it's perhaps a bit more saturated than I would have picked if I had seen the whole line in person, but I really, really love the finished result. This is my first time knitting with Shetland wool, and I really enjoyed it. You can tell why a tradition of stranded color knitting grew up with people who had this wool, because it's really easy to tension, um, and the yarn just likes to grab it. To each other and I love the subtle color play. I used pretty much the same colors as the designer because they were just so beautiful. I pretty much wanted her hat. Um, and then once it blocked, I really really love the fabric it blocked into. It bloomed beautifully and it has a really cohesive feel. And here is the inside. Ooh, so you can see I ended up weaving in a lot of ends because I was changing colors a bit more frequently than the pattern called for on the decreases. I would highly recommend this pattern. The chart is really charming. It's handwritten, which I just, I love that. I love how Ravelry lets enthusiastic amateur knitters exchange ideas as well as, of course, providing a forum for the professional designers. Um, the one thing I would say about the pattern is if you want a tam that looks like hers, do not use, and you're using Jameson's instead of Jameson and Smith, do not use her recommended wood smoke color because it's just not brown enough. Um, it's, and it's too similar to this color. So look for a different brown. And then the other thing I would say is the pattern didn't give any gauge requirements, and mine turned out a little bigger than I expected. Okay. Um, and I knit it on the recommended two and a half millimeter, or no, two and a half US, I can't remember what that is in millimeter, size, because when I did the ribbing, it fit really well at her recommendation, recommended stitches, but you know, I'm a loose knitter, and clearly I'm looser than she is, so. I think if I had gone down to one and a half or even twos, it would be fine. And I blocked it over, I don't have any 10 inch dinner plates, which is what she recommended, but I do have a 10 inch plastic lid to one of my Pyrex mixing bowls. It's the two quart one, I think, and it's what I use to block pretty much all my berets. In case you haven't knit a beret before, you knit it as a tube, like a beanie, and then once you're done, you do do more increases than you would for a beanie, but just right at the beginning after the ribbing. And then once you're done knitting the beret, you get it wet and then you dry it stretched over something circular like a plate. Um, and that's how you get that effect. You're not doing all these increases and decreases while you're actually knitting. So just helpful information. Yeah. So I will definitely be knitting more tams. I have enough of most of the colors that I think I'm going to try to do a pair of matching gloves. I haven't decided yet whether I should just use designs from the hat or there's this um, book that my library has. I think it's called Colorwork Mitts and Mittens Woodland Design, something like that. I'll link it. And she's got a bunch of different bird designs and I think it might be fun to do like 
I think she has a chickadee one and then a nuthatch one. I thought it might be fun to do birds to kind of go with the forest theme. I really love chickadees too. So, mulling that over for now. And then my last finished object. Can you tell that once I was well enough to knit again, I went on like a knitting binge? Uh, but I just cast the second one off yesterday are my Strong Current socks, which were knit in, I can, why can I not remember this, Sprout, Fiber Company Sprout, using Wendy Johnson Serpentine Socks pattern, which can be found in her first socks book, Toe Up Socks. And I am so pleased with how these turned out. Once again, they're a little more muted and gray in real life but they're just a beautiful color and I really like how the pattern and the yarn interacted. Um, the heel turned out well. It's got a gusset since I'm knitting. I knit these for a friend who I told her if she sent me yarn, I would knit her a pair of socks. So, and she said she has high arches, so I wanted the gusset. And these are actually the biggest socks I've knit because my friend wears a larger shoe size than me and she wanted them to come up pretty high on her leg. But I still really enjoyed it. Um, the yarn is about 500 yards to 125 grams. It comes in big skeins, so that maybe it went a little faster than usual. So the one thing about these is, since they're toe up, I had to do a stretchy bind off. And on the first one, I tried an elastic bind off from the book, cast on, bind off, 100 cast ons. I don't know, my library has it as an ebook, so I use it for reference. And I liked how stretchy it was, but I did not like how it frilled. I've noticed a lot of the stretchy bind-offs frill on ribbing, and I'm not a big fan of that. Um, so on the second one, I decided to try a different bind-off, and I ended up using the Invisible Sewn 2x2 Rib Bind-Off from a video by Knit Freedom on YouTube. I will link to it. When I first started knitting socks, I knit toe-up socks. And I would finish with a one by one rib and do her one by one invisible sewn bind off, which it turns out is actually grafting. So um, that's probably why I'm so fond of grafting. I've done that a lot. Uh, anyway, so yeah, so she modified it to work for two by two ribbing, and there's still a little bit of frilling, but not nearly so much. So I showed my friend on Instagram, and I told her to pick her preferred bind off and I would do the other one to match and she likes this one better too which thank goodness because that means I just need to rip out a normal bind off and not rip out a sewn bind off which would take a lot longer. So these are the socks. I have a good 45 grams left over so I'll see what I end up doing with that because I love this color um, and I will be blocking them before I send them to my friend. I don't usually block socks, but if they're a gift, I want them to look as fancy as they can. And I want to make sure they don't bleed all over her other stuff, you know, the first time she washes them. So I'll warn her of dye that's out in the sink. Those are all of my finished objects. Basically, I felt a little bit better by, I think, Monday, which is when that brown yarn came in for my hat. And so I just spent all my spare time knitting as like recompense for <laughs> the days that I couldn't knit at all. And so I have so much to talk about. This might be a little bit of a longer episode. Okay, works in progress. First up is, I'm calling it a pinch of nutmeg shawl, but it's the pattern is called Cinnamon Grace, so you can tell where I got the color inspiration from. This is more of a nutmeg brown, plus I like nutmeg more than cinnamon. It's a free pattern on Ravelry, and it's for a shallow crescent shawl. So basically, my um, experiments in knitted neckwear continue. And so far, I've knit that scarflet that you saw, and then I've knit a really big shawl. It was like 800 yards of a heavy lace weight. And it was almost like a cape style, I don't know, like a poncho. I ended up giving it to my great-great-aunt, who is a nun. And my mother and I visited her this summer when I was working on it, and she really loved it. And once I finished knitting it, I realized it would be difficult to work into my wardrobe anyway. And um, my great
great great aunt is 90, 91, and she's cold all the time, and it was made out of Elsa wool Cormo, so it was super soft and super fluffy, and she does, she makes a lot of rosaries, even though she's almost blind and she has a lot of arthritis in her fingers, but so she very much values hand crafts. So I just sent that off to her. Um, and then I made that big cowl out of worsted weight yarn. And now I've made myself a lace weight shawl or scarf, just regular smaller scarf. So this is a crescent shawl in sport weight yarn. And this yarn, oh my goodness guys, it's by the Fiber Company, who I had not tried before. And it's their Canopy Light, I believe. Hang on. No, it's Road to China Light. Let me bring it up. Because it is magic. Magic in a skin. It's 65% baby alpaca, 15% silk, 10% camel, and 10% cashmere. Oh my gosh. I started winding the first skein into a ball, and I cannot even tell you how lovely it was as it was slipping through my fingers. So I got three skeins off D-Stash D -stash this summer to knit some type of net wear. And so I got a I got a good deal on it. I basically got three for the price of two. Um, it's a luxury yarn. But D-Stash deals and it's in the smoky quartz colorway which is a really beautiful brown and it just kind of shimmers anyway okay so this shawl I love this yarn can you tell I really want to try more of their yarns now just because oh my goodness this stuff it's like yarn magic it just seems like perfect yarn so this shawl first you knit the body and it's a free pattern so I'm not giving away anything but first you knit the body and then you knit an edging, so that's why the stockinette is curling up. It's wider than it looks. There we go. Then you knit an edging, and it's kind of a roughly lace edging with a pico bind off. So one of the people who've made it mentioned that it took um, basically half her yarn to do the body and half her yarn to do the edging. So I did my increase section, and I did a few more increases than the pattern calls for. I did it until I had 40 stitches total. And then I weighed my yarn, and I had used half a skein, so 25 grams. So then I knit the center section, which you just knit straight. I knit until I finished that skein, because I knew that the decrease section would take another 25 grams, and then I would have the other half of my yarn left over for the edging. So I've just attached the second skein of yarn. Usually I would attach at the edge, but because the garter stitch edging, this is the edging that's going to stay, um, I'd rather weave into the body where you're less likely to see it. So I have just started that and just started my decreases, and this has been my simple knitting. I like having a combination of complicated and simple knitting, so that depending on my mood or if I want to knit while I'm reading or FaceTiming, that kind of stuff. And as you can tell, I have been really, really enjoying this because I think I cast this on, let's see, I cast this on on November 16th, which was Monday. And today is Saturday, and I'm already a third of the way through it. Of course, the edging is going to be the longer part, but yeah, I really love this, so I will do an episode soon about the lessons I've learned from knitwear so far. Oh my goodness. I might have put a sweater's quantity worth of one of their fingering weight yarns on my Christmas list, because I'm in love with it. Okay, other works in progress. I just started some new socks this morning. I wound up the yarn last night. And then I am not sleeping very well because I'm still not, I'm still in a flare-up. I'm just in a milder stage of the flare-up. So I woke up pretty early this morning and when I didn't fall back asleep, I'm like, fine, I'll just start the socks. So this is out of Quince and Company's Finch. And it's out of, they do two natural heathers and this is the lighter one. I believe it's called Adouin or something. 
it looks French to me, but I'm not really sure how you would pronounce it in English. It's like a sheepy cream, but it's like a cool cream, if that makes sense. I don't know. And it's not, it's not light enough to be a white. Um, it's showing up pretty accurately back here. So these are going to be a pair of the Pointel socks by Cookie A from her Knit Sock Love Book. I'm really excited about this because I enjoy knitting pattern socks, but I have not yet knit a Cookie A design. I'm not sure why. Um, so yeah, I've just begun, I finished the ribbing and just begun the first chart. So you can't really see any patterning yet, but this is a really pretty pattern. And I'm calling these my marzipan socks because it's a kind of frilly pattern. And this color reminds me of marzipan. Oh my goodness, how am I going to do get to my topic and stay in 40 minutes? This might be a longer episode, guys. Okay. Next up, um, I'm participating in the... Art History Craft Along, run by M from the Knitting Pretty podcast, which is an audio podcast that I highly recommend if you are not listening to it. Um, it says explicit when you look at it in iTunes, but she almost never swears. So, I mean, I'm sure she does occasionally. I'm not really sensitive to swearing, so I wouldn't notice it, but um, I'm listening to another podcast now where they swear frequently, and I do notice that, so I wouldn't worry about the explicit rating. Uh, and she's really funny. So, for the craft along, she majored in art history in college, and so she picked, I think, 10 inspiring works of art, and you just need to make a project that is somehow related to one of them. And I asked her if she had any art history book recommendations, because it's a subject I would like to know more of, and she recommended Glorious Visions, which is a book about Gothic architecture, and then one of her pieces of artwork on her list was a gothic cathedral. I can't remember which one specifically. And so I decided this would be a perfect use of Piper, which is Quince and Company's lace weight, 50% mohair, 50% merino, all Texan animals, which I think is fun because my family lives in Texas and I've spent a few years there. My father was career military, so we're not native Texans, but we certainly spent a lot of time there. So... Um, I wanted to do a gothic cathedral beret and scarf out of this. And I found a really nice scarf pattern that I think will be perfect for it. It's a knitty pattern. But of course, I can't remember the name. Juno, I think. But in the meantime, I was reading the book. And at first, I thought I was going to adapt an existing hat pattern. But then I was reading the book and I was so inspired that I decided to go to knittingfool.com, which has the stitch dictionary, and design my own. And for the brim, so for the hat itself, I've already found I'm going to do an arching lace pattern because Gothic cathedrals, you know, lots of arches. And then alternate it with a twisted stitch pattern that also looks Gothic. But then... I was really inspired by the decorations inside the church and all of the beautiful stonework. And they do a lot, they did a lot of stylized nature in their stonework decoration, which I always enjoy. And so I found an oak leaf stitch pattern, and I am using that for my brim. I don't know how well this is going to show up on the camera because it's kind of blowing things out. You can kind of see it. So this... You cast on 28 stitches, but then the stitch count changes with every row. But because you cast on 28 stitches and I'm making it as a hat brim, and because this is a lace weight yarn and I wanted it to be nice and thick around my ears, knitting it on my triple zeros. And so it's a fiddly pattern and pretty much it takes... Every leaf is about an inch, so I'll be doing 20 between 20 and 22 leaves. And it's, I want to say, the original one is 38 rows, and after that I think it's 32 rows. So, yes. Basically, it's a lot of work, but I think it's going to be worth it. So, here it is so far. It looks more, the leaves are more prominent in real life when they're not being blown out by a webcam. But... This is wonderful yarn. I'm really enjoying knitting with it. Um, 
even the fiddly baubles and stuff, cabled baubles in fact. And I love this stitch pattern because it's just so clever. I mean, you follow the somewhat crazy directions and suddenly you have a very realistic oak leaf, or at least a very realistic stylized oak leaf. And I like how the light gray, there we go, uh, of the yarn looks like weathered stone. So I'm just really pleased with how this is turning out. So I'm slipping one edge, and that's the edge I'm going to pick up stitches from. Usually I don't slip an edge if I'm going to pick up stitches, but in this case I'm knitting at such a tighter gauge for the brim than I will be for the hat, which is going to be on ones, one and a halfs, I think. I can't remember which I swatched with, but I still have the needles in my basket. So I know that I only need to pick up for every other row at the most. So that's one of those slow knitting projects. I have plenty of other hats to keep me warm in the meantime, so I might as well take my time and make it the way I want it. But yeah, pretty much each leaf takes 20 minutes. Now that I've gotten more comfortable with the pattern, that's quite a bit of knitting. And my final work in progress, I promise not to go crazy with my knitting so that next week's episode is shorter, is Christmas knitting for my niece. So the bathrobe plan has been scrapped because I got her measurements and she is essentially my size. She's almost 10. She's a little smaller than me, but if you include the positive ease you would need with a dressing gown, I'd basically be making myself a long sleeve knee length dress in five weeks. Not gonna happen. So I broke that news to her and we had a bit of a commiseration and then I thought that I would knit her a couple stuffed animals and then a pair of socks or another pair of mitts because she really likes yarn that's multiple colors, but she doesn't like yarn that stripes. And so when I was on the Knit Pick site looking for Reverie, which is their brushed baby alpaca to make more stuffed animals, I noticed that they have a speckled sock yarn right now and it's in her favorite shades of like warm, bright blues. So I thought it would make great socks. So I showed it to her and she's decided it would make an excellent squirrel. She's so funny because usually she's very insistent on realistic animals. Like all the cute little baby doll style stuffed animals she will have nothing to do with. But I don't know, a blue speckled squirrel apparently floats her boat. So I showed her pictures of various patterns and I had her pick a few and then I'm going to make some and so I started knitting the first one with my leftover Reverie in Porcini and this is actually what the pattern calls for and it is the cutest pattern. It's by Barbara Prime. It's a paid for pattern but it's only three dollars and it is for a three-toed slob. Uh, I will include the link because you should go look at the photo. Oh my goodness, sloths are so adorable. Um, when I used to live in Texas, my niece and I would go to the library frequently. We got this picture book out from the library that was all photographs, not illustrations, from this sloth rescue center in Costa Rica, and it had all these different baby sloths, and we spent like months just getting it back out from the library so that we could ooh and awe over it. So this will be really special. And this is my, oh, things look kind of okay, obscene, uh, I just noticed. So this is my first time doing a seamed stuffed animal, and so I've made two legs, which look more leg-like. So they're really cute because they've got little feet built in. And so, yeah, so I left long ends for seaming. And when I started knitting, I, this would have completely put me off, but now that I know how to seam with mattress stitch, and I've seamed a few sweaters, I don't feel at all phased by having to seam. And it's actually, in a way, less fiddly because you're not doing small diameter knitting on, on DPMs. So, I will be starting the body of that soon. I'm going to knit her three stuffed animals. Um, sloth, blue squirrel, and then a raccoon. Oh, and then a baby bunny, also blue. So, that'll be fun. And so I plan to intersperse those with other projects because I'm not obsessed with knitting stuffed animals. In fact, I used to 
dislike it, actively dislike it, and now I've come to enjoy it in small doses. But I want to make sure that I enjoy this Christmas knitting, which is why I'm not knitting her a dressing gown. So I figure I'll just alternate it with other projects. And I told you last week I don't use project bags much, but since I'm knitting it in pieces, I thought it would be handy to keep all the pieces in one place. Okay, so yarn acquisitions. We're going to go quickly. I'm still not at my topic. I'm already at 40 minutes. As I mentioned, I needed to order more brown yarn for the hat. Well, not more brown yarn. I needed to order a brown for the hat. And I ended up finding it at Paradise Fibers. And so I wasn't feeling well. And I decided that um, since I was paying shipping anyway, I might as well order some other stuff. So I got another color of Jameson's for the hat I'm planning to do next, which will be self-designed. I have quite a few pinks, but none super pale. I love this color. It's called Oyster. This one's Pete, by the way. Those are both pretty accurate. And then I got a skein of Berger, their sock yarn, which is called Gumi, which probably sounds less silly in French. I don't know, Gumi? <laughs> anyway. I have not tried their sock yarn before, but I've been interested in trying a pattern sock, and I really liked the colors. It's got grays and creams and then splashes of different pastels, which is right up my alley. And at the time when I ordered it, I thought it would be nice to cast them on right away so that I would have something simple to knit, because I would just knit these plain stockinettes since they're patterned. Um, and I didn't have my shawl cast on yet. That's been my simple knitting this week. But my needles are already in use with the socks I was knitting for friends. So I noticed that their Lantern Moon sock DPNs were on sale. So I ordered a set of those in zeros, which are my usual sock size. It actually came with six. I'm using one of them as the cable needle for the brim of my hat. And I was a little disappointed. I didn't realize that I ordered... I don't know. They're wood, but they're like, they're not, you don't see the wood tone because they're almost graphite looking. I don't know. They're pretty and they match the yarn really well. So I thought it would be good to try out a different company's DPNs just in case anything happens to the my irreplaceable Diet Craft ones. So, yep, yeah, that's that. And then I... I have decided I want to do a colorwork sweater. And the one I want to do is from this book, Stranded Knits by Anne Kingston, which I ordered after knitting her swan yoke sweater. I'm really enjoying that. And I like how she does stranded knitting with shaping in it. So, and it goes down to my size. So, the swan pattern has a very amusing name for us Americans called Wet Wang, which is apparently um, a place in Yorkshire known for its black swans. Um, so, yeah, I knit mine out of a linen blend yarn. I'll wear it maybe for the next episode so that I can talk more about it then. Or not linen, nettle, out of a nettle blend yarn because one of my favorite fairy tales is... The Seven Swans, about the girl who has to spin and knit sweaters for her brothers. I will talk about that when I wear that sweater. So, this is the pattern I want to make. It's called Field Study. Isn't it beautiful? And, um, this book has some instructions at the front as well as patterns. So, I figured for my first all over... There's the back. Oh, okay, that's just the dimensions, so I'm not giving anything away. Um, for my first all over Fair Isle, I, it would be easier to follow a pattern than just try to wing it on my own. And I love this pattern. I really like her design aesthetic. Uh, so I knew I wanted to knit that, and I decided I wanted to knit it in blue and white. And I looked at, I have a few different color cards and none of the quince blues were quite right. And then with Brown Sheep, which is another American company, I really liked their blue fog color. So I decided that I would order, they call it a sport weight, but it's a really light sport weight. So I think it'll knit up at the same gauge that she is calling for. And 
I was actually really surprised. Gosh, I need better posture in this chair. Anyway, I was really surprised by the yardage requirements because when I knit myself sweaters, I don't know, I think they've taken between 900 and 1100 yards total. And this one calls for, in my size, it would be, let's see, five times 191. So just under a thousand yards of one color and over a thousand yards of the second color. So that's double. So I'm not really sure if that's accurate or not, but the nice thing about Brown Sheep is that in addition to selling their nature spun line on in balls, they also sell it on cones. And so basically the cones, and you can get the cones for very reasonable prices. I got this one off D-Stash for $25, including shipping, but I had to buy this one from the store. This is the Blue Fog colorway, by the way. And once again, imagine it more muted than it's showing up on the screen. Um, and I think it was still only maybe $30, $31 plus shipping. And it's a full pound. They're not going to have the yardage, of course, but it's, it's a lot of yardage. So basically... Rather than buy a bunch of skeins and then be really annoyed if I have a lot left over or risk buying fewer skeins and then be terrified I'm going to run out of yarn, I can get both of these for the same price that I would get the balls, about half the yardage in balls. And then if I have some a lot left over, I mean, you can always use natural colored yarn, and then I would love to make a pair of tights in this color. Okay, so that was my plan, but I wasn't going to buy the yarn yet because... My stash is fine, and I can buy it whenever. But I noticed that Blue Fog is selling out at a lot of the online retailers, and I was afraid that they were going to phase out that colorway. So there was only one store left that I could even find it on cones instead of in balls. So I decided to go ahead and get that. As I mentioned, I got the natural color on D-Stash at the same time. So I'm really looking forward to that cardigan. Or not cardigan, jumper. And that is all of my yarn acquisitions. I'd love to say that I won't buy any more yarn for the year, but I've already placed an order for Christmas knitting, and I need to place one more. And whenever I do orders for other people, I usually end up throwing in a ball for myself. But my stash is definitely as healthy as I want it to be, so, um, and I'm sure I'll get some yarn for Christmas. So next year, I, I probably won't need to buy yarn for quite a while. Don't hold me to that, though. Okay, so, darn. Do I have time to talk about a topic? I think I will anyway. So this week, I wanted to talk about new knitters, and even more specifically, aspiring knitters, because I've had questions from two people who were saying, oh, I would really love to be able to knit but I don't, basically. And my response is, you can. You can definitely knit. I mean, I remember I've been knitting for a little over two and a half years now, so I distinctly remember I found knitting blogs before that. And, yeah, just looking at all the posts and the beautiful photographs and the yarn and really wishing I could be a part of it, but I didn't think that I could, both because of my illness issues and just because, you know, I tried to knit a couple times in the past and it just didn't seem very enjoyable. Um, so, yes, my first thing is if you want to learn how to knit and you are motivated and you love yarn and you have a pattern that you love, you can definitely knit. I mean, for most of history, children were taught how to knit and they were like churning out socks by the time they were six or seven. So... It doesn't require any kind of hand-eye coordination that you don't already have as an adult. Um, I do know that as adults, a lot of times, we're not used to trying something and being bad at it at first. I know that this is hard for me because I have some perfectionist tendencies. So if I try something and I'm not, and I don't meet my very high expectations right away, there's a part of me that wants to just, you know, quit and be like, oh, well, that's not for me. But... You know, so when you first start knitting, it's going to feel really awkward, but just stick with it, and pretty soon 
basically your hands have to catch up with your brain, right? Because you see all these beautiful knitting projects and you want to make them as well. Um, and you can. I meant to bring over my first knitting projects so that I could show them to you, but we're already running so late and I forgot to bring them over here. So maybe I'll make this a two part. Okay, so this will be part one and then next week I will address more issues. So. If you are interested in learning to knit, here are my recommendations. Get yourself some really beautiful worsted weight yarn that you love how it feels and you really love the color. If you have a local yarn store, then that will be your best bet because then you can see them all in person. But if you don't have a local yarn store and you're looking to buy online, I would recommend looking at Malabrigo Worsted, which is very reasonably priced. It's about eleven dollars for two hundred twenty yards, and it comes in the most beautiful kettle dies, and it's super soft and just really enjoyable to knit with. I've taught my mom, my sister, and my niece how to knit, and I used Malabrigo with all of them, and they all liked it. So, okay, so get some Malabrigo, and then get yourself some size seven needles. I would recommend bamboo because different needles hold the yarn in different ways and when you're starting out one of your major fears is that all your stitches are going to fall off and then your project is going to like unravel before your horrified eyes and that is not really I mean you don't really have to worry about that too much but just to allay those fears so that you're not gripping the needles super tightly just get some bamboo needles because the yarn will stay better on them. Oh, and it, you don't have to get Malabrigo, of course, but do make sure you're getting a wool yarn because knitting is just easier with wool. So I would recommend a 16 inch circular needle because as you can see right now, you can knit flat on circular needles as well as in a circle. So there's no reason to get straight needles. And so once you've practiced and made a bookmark or two or a coaster or a pot holder, you know, anything flat like that, then you can use that same 16 inch circular needle to begin a hat, which I think is one of the best beginner projects because it goes much more quickly than a scarf, but it doesn't require many skills. And the ones that it does require, you can learn along the way. And who doesn't like to wear hats? I mean, as long as you're in a chilly climate, hats are super helpful. So, I would also recommend learning English style rather than continental. I, my default is continental, but I'm knitting English style right now. Um, so English style just means you're carrying the yarn in your right hand, and continental, you carry the yarn in your left hand. And it doesn't really matter whether you're right-handed or left-handed, and I say that having taught my sister, who is a lefty, and my mother, who is a righty. I'm a righty as well. And both of them found English style easier to learn than continental. So if you don't have any background, if you have a crochet background, then you can start with whatever. But if you don't have any background with yarn, then it's easier to learn how to knit English style. And the reason why is because when you're knitting English style, I may hold the yarn all at once because it goes more quickly, but you can learn just as well. You don't, you can just wrap the yarn around and then just kind of hold it like this and pull it through. So you're really focusing more on the needle movements and getting your hands used to it. And then later you can modify your technique uh, to get it a little faster and smoother. And also, in English style, knitting and purling are basically the same thing. Your hand movement is the same, it's just your needles go in at a different angle. Whereas in continental, not only do you have to manage to pick up the yarn with just the needle hook, or point, sorry, no hooks. Whereas in English, you're wrapping it around with your finger, so not only do you need to have that skill, but you also need to keep an even amount of tension on the yarn, which you do by the way you hold it in your left hand. And that's trickier for beginners. And so 
to me, I just think it makes more sense to start out with English style, having taught a few people. And they all got really frustrated with the continental style, and they all were very happy with the English style. And then once you've been knitting for a bit, you can try out continental and see what you like more. I know that um, there's a lot of stuff on the internet about how continental is faster than English style. And Sarah, one of the people who was asking me a lot of questions as an aspiring knitter, worried that if she learned English style instead of continental style, she would be a much slower knitter. But Hazel Tyndall is, I think she holds the world record for knitting speed right now, and she knits with the yarn in her right hand. So really, when you're a beginner, your projects are going to take a while because you're still learning, you're probably going to rip back a lot, at least if you're like me and you want the finished object to be perfect, so you pull out your mistakes. Uh, which, that's one of the things that's nice about knitting. You just ball the yarn back up and start again. It's not like sewing, where if you cut the piece wrong, you can't glue the fabric back together. Anyway, so as a beginner, no matter which style you pick, you're going to be slower. And... I would say that the major thing is to just pick bigger yarn and bigger needles if you want your project to be finished sooner as a beginner. That's the best strategy. And then the other thing that I think affects speed of knitting is how big or small your movements are, and that's something that I really want to work on because that also affects the ergonomics of knitting and how comfortable your body is. But that's something that you can worry about later. Basically. If you want to learn how to knit and you're overwhelmed and you feel like you cannot do it, just get some worsted weight wool, get a size 7 circular needle, and either if you have a local knitting store, they probably have beginner classes, or you can use videos on YouTube, or you can get books from the library, or you can buy books from Amazon. Um... So depending on your learning method, there are lots of different ways. And be prepared to be bad at it at first. And, you know, your hands need time to learn the movements. But you will eventually improve. And in the meantime, you can make some really fun stuff. I mean, my first project was a hat. And then I made fingerless mitts. And then I made socks. So, and if you don't, if... You want to finish your project quickly, you should probably stick with basic knitting, you know, stock and stitch. But if you're not that concerned about how long it's going to take, you can really do any technique you want as long as you find a pattern that you really like so you have a lot of inspiration and the pattern is helpful and you've got Google with YouTube near you. I mean, I was using cables from my second project and I designed my own hat for I think my fourth project so knitting is very accessible and all the techniques once you know how to knit and purl and yarn over all of the techniques are just variations on that so they all seem a little strange and difficult until you try them and then you're good so as a beginner or an experienced knitter if you've never tried cabling before it might sound weird, but then when you actually try it out in practice, it's really not that hard. And I would say that's true about most knitting things. The final recommendation I will do for this, and I know I said this was going to be part one, but I think really I'm giving you a pep talk, and for practicalities, there are a ton of really good YouTubers who are making beautiful tutorial videos, or there's Craftsy which has free classes as well as sold classes, and all of them are going to be better quality videos than any one I can put together. So I'm not going to show you the actual specifics. I just want to get you inspired and know that you can knit. So to wrap it up and all in one segment, I would highly recommend looking into Elizabeth Zimmerman. Hang on. Oh, another, another decrease row. Okay. And Elizabeth Zimmerman was a very famous knitter, and she was British, but she moved to the U.S. during World War II. She had a German husband, and she ended up settling in Wisconsin. And she put out a newsletter, and then she wrote books, and she did some shows for PBS. And I was very lucky because my library in Texas, where I learned to knit, 
had one of her shows on PB on DVD, and so I checked it out, and I watched her, and really, she was very inspiring as far as you can do this, even if you're a beginner, and all of her books have that tone, too, and they're all really fun reads on their own, um, even if you don't want to knit. They're very, they include memoirs and asides, and she has a very personable writing style. Uh, so I would highly recommend looking into her for inspiration. And okay, so my last thing with beginners is you don't have to be afraid of stitches falling off your needle. See, look, I popped all these stitches off my needle and look, my scarf is still in one piece. It's okay. <laughs> all you have to do, and this is more slippery yarn than wool, is so the only thing that would cause my scarf to start popping out right now is if I yanked horizontally. So what you want to do, if you drop the stitches, is just pinch it and put your needle back through them. And you want to make sure that so that the right side is towards the front and the left side is towards the back, which will make more sense when you watch some actual knitting tutorials. But I just wanted to show you that your knitting project is not going to dissolve <laughs> if stitches pop off. It's fine. You can put them back. <laughs> so <laughs> that is my pep talk, I guess. I would just say, you know, two and a half years ago, I didn't knit. And these days, I can make all kinds of beautiful things. And it is a craft that has brought so much joy and inspiration and mental stimulation, as well as the tactile pleasures into my life. Um, I can't imagine not knitting or giving it up these days. And so I highly encourage you to take up knitting. If you are at all interested, just give it a try. I mean, one needle and a ball of yarn, especially Malabrigo, isn't going to run you too much. So it's not like you have to buy a whole sewing machine or something to try it out. And yeah, if you have any more questions, I am always available. I am happy to answer questions via email or on Instagram or in comments on my blog. It might take me a few days depending on how my hands feel because typing is hard on them. But I have also decided to start a Ravelry group. For the podcast and I feel very presumptuous doing that but I especially wanted to do it this week if I'm going to do it so that all of you other knitters who are watching can chime in with any tips or pep talks you have for newbie knitters or aspiring knitters people who wish that they could knit and aren't sure if they have it in them so I will start a thread over on Ravelry because of course that should be my final tip if you're a beginning knitter as soon as you get your yarn and needles, get yourself a Ravelry account. Uh, it's a magical website <laughs> that it's just a wonderful resource um, and it will definitely help you in anything you can imagine with patterns or reading about yarn or anything else. So this has turned into a longer podcast than I intended. Uh, both my pets decided to sleep elsewhere. I guess me throwing around projects is too much. Since they're not here, I'll show you really quickly. Ooh, now that I'm sitting on it. That's the uh, tail part of the tail coat jacket. And with that, happy knitting. I hope that you enjoyed the podcast. And if you wish you could knit, just pick up some needles and yarn. And soon you will be a knitter. Bye, guys.